special report on the Salk polio vaccine. People are asking, is it absolutely safe? Does it really protect against polio? There are three key points for safety testing during this process. The first is during the period of inactivation. Nearly everyone is in repeated contact with the virus and is infected by it at some time in his life. Experience indicates that there will be scattered local epidemics and some may be severe. There is no such thing as a perfect vaccine against this disease, poliomyelitis, or any other disease. Indeed, there is no such thing as a perfect vaccine. But as history has shown, time and time again, a vaccine does not need to be perfect to save millions of lives. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Williams, Dean of the Faculty here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the second program in our Public Health Storyteller Series, Facts Over Fear, a conversation with Heidi Larson, author of Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go Away. It's exactly one year ago today that the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic. We have rung the bell loud and clear, said WHO Chief Dr. Tedros. He said at the time, this is not just a public health crisis. It is a crisis that will touch every sector. So every sector and every individual must be involved in the fight. Today, a year later, that warning has borne out tenfold as every aspect of our lives have changed. Millions have lost their jobs. We have lost mothers, fathers, neighbors, teachers, doctors, nurses, and untold numbers of friends. More than 117 million people globally have been infected by the virus. And just this week, the world surpassed 2.6 million deaths. This last year has been a year of reckoning for all of us. I have heard many say, and I've even said myself, that the pandemic brought us to our knees. Yet today, I have hope, and many of us have hope, as one of public health's greatest achievements, vaccines have taken hold. At the same time, I also know that the reality we are facing include concerns and fears about vaccine. Vaccine fears rooted in historical trauma, along with rumors and misinformation that's amplified by the speed of social media are now the greatest threats to any chance we have of this pandemic actually coming to an end. Which is why today's conversation is so incredibly important as we shift to this new phase. One that will save lives and one day allow, to, allow us to declare that COVID-19 pandemic is over. This is the fight of our lifetime, one we will all be involved in. And with that, I'd like to express my enormous gratitude to Heidi Larson and our moderator, Nat Jenis, and to our other panelists for joining us today for the conversation entitled Facts Over Fear. Nat, I'd like to turn over to you and also welcome you back to Harvard, at least virtually. Over to you. <laughs> 
Awesome. Thank you, Dean Williams. And thank you to the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, I'm Nat Jenis. I'm the founding director of the Digital Health Lab at technology nonprofit Medan. And I'm truly so honored to be here with you today hosting the second installment of the Harvard T.H. Chan Public Health Storyteller Series. It is my great pleasure to be joined today by Professor Heidi Larson, the world-renowned anthropologist who has dedicated her life's work to understanding and monitoring confidence in vaccines around the world. Um, truly a pioneer in this field. Heidi is the author of the much heralded book, Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go Away. And um, before we begin, for all of you watching, we invite you to submit questions via Facebook at facebook.com slash Harvard School of Public Health. So welcome, Heidi, or should I say welcome back? Um, it's pretty awesome to be here at uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health as I'm a graduate and you're a former fellow. Yeah, and I did my BA there, so it's a, it's a whole, uh, it's quite a reunion. Sorry, I'm not there in person. Yeah, definitely full circle, um, especially with some of these amazing researchers um, and leaders on this in this conversation. And it's especially exciting to have you here during International Women's Week and Women's History Month, where we really have this opportunity to highlight the roles and the contributions that women, including women in this conversation, have played in vaccine distribution and response um, and research as well. That's for sure. I mean, it's we've seen an extraordinary impact on women, even though the disease burden and the mortality has been more uh, with men, although the difference is not that big, but the burden of the caring and the schooling and the other issues and losing jobs has been quite, quite uh, tremendous on women. But there's still a lot of leadership out there and, um, and across vaccines, not just COVID. For sure, and um, we're super lucky to have you on this call um, and to have the rest of the researchers here as well to hopefully unpack that a little bit. Um, so before we start, I wanted to share um, through this research that I've conducted at Medan's Digital Health Lab in collaboration with journalists and fact-checking organizations, it's become really clear how important it is before we start conversations around health misinformation response work or rumors or this field more generally to sort of ground in this reduction of stigma. Um, and, uh, you know, we've all heard health misinformation um, or vaccine rumors referred to as outlandish. Um, but we really want to start by phrasing that it isn't an us and them issue. It's something that affects everyone. Um, so before we start, I'd like to share a public health myth that even as a researcher, as a scientist, I still carry with me to this day. Um, and that was a growing up, um, whenever I would touch my nose, my mom probably who might be watching this right now and watching me touch my nose would tell me that it would grow. Um, and to this day, even when I reach to touch my nose, it's become sort of habitual. Um, I think of her and feel a bit of anxiety, even though I know it's not true, even though I know it, it's, it's, it's a myth, I still kind of carry it with me. So Heidi, is there one public health myth or vaccine myth that you always carry with you? Well, my German grandmother um, told me it didn't matter if it was a cough, a cold, a stomach ache, or a broken toe, chamomile would fix it. So I've always got a tea bag, a bag of chamomile in my bag. And, you know, even if it doesn't fix my broken toe, I feel better. Yeah. And I mean, the comfort element is what's so important. And, you know, it is important to also share that we do all carry these myths with us. Um, and to pivot it back to vaccines, sort of in the simplest terms, um, what are the myths or what is it about those myths that make um, people generally hesitant to take vaccines specifically? Well, I think um, myth is a bit different than rumor. Um, rumor is kind of an unverified piece of information that could turn out to be true. And and I think sometimes I say in some of my lectures in my, in my classes that rumors actually have a bad reputation um, because we used rumors in a lot of ways for disease detection, especially in outbreaks. They do have a, an important function and particularly in contexts like COVID now, where we have so much uncertainty, we, we might, we need to listen to pieces of information that are emerging because maybe there's something in them. But myths, um, 
are a, a bit more when they've been proven to not be so true, but they stick. Um, and I think there are also um, some rumors who are that are clearly not correct that that also spread wildly. And those are the ones that, from a public health perspective, uh, we're, we're concerned about because they do impact public human behavior. Of course, and especially in the case of vaccines, we know that this isn't a new challenge for the field of public health or anyone working in vaccine distribution or response, um, you know, from vaccines from smallpox and polio, this idea of hesitancy, um, the shapes that myths take has been around as long as vaccines themselves. That's true. I mean, we saw with some of the early early images before we got at the beginning of the program here, um, these uh, historic episodes of, of, I mean, there was one within the early images of a mother with her child and the, the vaccination monster. And um, these, these are, I mean, I'm here in the UK, which is where the first anti-vaccine league started. And actually, I, sh I will correct myself, it wasn't an anti-vaccine league. It was the anti-compulsory vaccine league. And I think sometimes um, we've misunderstood what <laughs> what really the, the the roots of the resistance were, and that was about for, people feeling like they lost, they didn't have any control, they didn't have any choice, and that that goes that goes way back. Issues of liberty and freedom. Were there other factors that made um, those issues around choice, around liberty, more pertinent and kind of directed towards vaccines? Well, I think uh, there are a lot of public health interventions, but I think vaccines is one of the only ones that is really totally global. Everyone's counted every year. Um, there are more and more vaccines. They're uh, regulated by government, recommended by government, sometimes required by government. Um, they are counted nationally. They are counted subnationally. They are reported to the World Health Organization. Anyone who has any anxiety about being counted, for one thing. And two, it's... Um, yeah, I think it's it's different. I mean, I think the closest thing to vaccines in terms of public health uh, real achievements uh, is water. But even with water, you you have more choice. Um, and there's something about vaccines that feels too required, too instructed. Do you think that debates around vaccine necessity have gone more not mainstream now than they have in the past? Yeah, I think they've certainly gone more mainstream. Uh, that's partly because of the nature of people having a lot more access to information, but we also have a lot more vaccines. I mean, back uh, with smallpox, uh, the smallpox vaccine, that was one vaccine that stirred the resistance. I mean, when you think about it, if you start counting the number of shots, I mean, some vaccines require two, three um, injections, and then there's combinations of vaccines. And as we get older, uh, a lot of these vaccines weren't meant for people living as long as we do. So you start to need boosters. We have now adolescent vaccines like HPV. We have vaccines for uh, pregnant women. There's uh, there's more and more vaccines along. So there's a lot more to be debating and have issues with. Yeah, as absolutely. Well as we celebrate, I should say. <laughs> yeah, at the same time, definitely. And um, it's interesting to that accompanying this volume. Um, it seems that rumors have also become particularly powerful. Um, how have these rumors become so powerful? Well, I think that um, in the context of COVID, people, you know, it's a very unsettling time. There's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and one of the, I mean, in my book and in, in my research, I look at uh, triggers, what starts a rumor, um, what is the fertile ground? I mean, one of the biggest reasons that vaccines spread is that there's fertile ground for it. There's some public appetite for it. The rumor must be answering something that's a public concern and there are mediums to, to spread it. Um, I, I've seen the same rumor in two or three different settings around the world 
and in one or two places it'll fizzle and die in another one it can create a statewide boycott about a vaccine so it really depends on cultural setting historical setting um on times of uncertainty like now uh with covid so it's a lot of factors yeah and when you originally started the vaccine confidence project to sort of understand and monitor um, vaccine rumors and how they progress and change over time and monitoring rumors really before they take hold. Um, how were you integrating this, you know, research around the individual factors and context? Can you tell us a bit about um, your start of that project? Yeah, I, I had been working in UNICEF uh, as the lead for the strategy and communication around the introduction of new vaccines and launching, we were launching Gabby, UNICEF was the chair of Gabby at the time. Um, and we, uh, my role was to be doing proactive positive communication to introduce these vaccines. Uh, and I ended up really getting the nickname of the director of UNICEF's fire department because I was doing more kind of crisis communication than proactive communication in some settings. And I was really struck by that. I, you know, and it was hard to come to terms with these are fantastic new vaccines. And it was different reasons in different settings. Uh, sometimes it was a community. Sometimes it was, you know, someone even in government who felt like, whoa, enough, you know, we can barely keep up with what we have. Um, and other people had played, played it politically. Um, and there were a whole mix of religious, other people had religious issues. Um, and I realized this was a, this was a much more complex um, area and really in our day job, which was moving fast and trying to get things out to the field and making sure we were very focused on cold chain, making sure people were trained, that there was readiness, the healthcare providers, uh, workers were ready. Um, and then there was this whole other dimension that wasn't just the, the, tip, the normal proactive communication, but how do we deal with this fallout? Uh, and I saw that it was important to try to detect some of these emerging issues much earlier. Um, and, and that's why I started the Confidence Project to try to set up a, a kind of risk assessment, kind of keeping our eye, a weather, a weather station as it were, um, to see the emerging clouds as they came. It's really interesting that, um, you know, addressing rumors wasn't an original part of, you know, these types of campaigns. Um, I'm curious of your thought of how that's kind of changed over time. Well, you know, they were there. Rumors are as old as humans. I mean, it's it's kind of a, it, it plays a social function. I mean, people spread rumors. They're trying to make sense of something that doesn't necessarily uh, make sense or, or has questions. And they come collectively try to come up with solutions. And the more that there's a void of information, um, the more likely uh, they come up. Um, and so, as I said, you know, with, with, it's one thing with one vaccine, but then you have a lot of vaccines, you have different players. Um, you know, there's one of the big big issues behind uh, vaccine acceptance is trust. I mean, it is foundational for people and, and trust is made up in, in most of the literature and it's mostly defined in, in philosophy actually. Trust is uh, relational and it's about, do you have trust in the competence and the ability of the individual or institution uh, that you're engaging with? And uh, two, do you trust their motives? I mean, are they, you know, giving me this vaccine because they think it's really good for me or my child or because they're going to make a dollar or two or more. Um, and why do people fund these programs? What's their motive? I mean, that's a dominant one we see in the current COVID uh, rumor landscape. Yeah, for sure. And really highlights the important role of journalists in all of this work is, you know, exposing and uncovering and telling these stories and sharing these narratives and, um, you know, painting the bigger picture beyond kind of the implementation, the health worker that's directly providing a vaccine to an individual. Yeah, that's that's for sure. And I think we need to be uh, not only uh, exposing, exposing them, but coming up with alternative narratives, because if we don't have 
kind of the correct ones stories kind of circling um that's when people cling on to the the misinformation is when they don't have a better story yeah definitely um and i think you know this kind of relates to what stories have been told and the impact that they have on people's decisions to vaccinate um, where there are decisions available. And you have written that vaccines are, you know, sometimes a victim of their own success. So, you know, in other words, most people today haven't seen, or in some cases, haven't seen the harsh realities of past diseases like polio or mumps or measles. Um, but with COVID-19, we have seen um, destruction and consequence and death all around us. So how is it that those narratives around disease and around death, um, they haven't helped with rumors um, with myths and with hesitancy? Well, I think it just points to the fact that it's not just about the information and it's not just about the disease. Um, for a certain portion of the population, um, that imminent threat of a virus will make a difference for them in terms of, I mean, there are people we see since the beginning of COVID until now, the surveys about people's willingness to take a vaccine are very much reflective of the state of the epidemic. And the risk that people have because they're constantly weighing and we don't give publics enough credit for, you know, the fact that they are doing their own kind of risk assessment. Am, am I, is it worth taking the risk of this brand new vaccine that's never been made this way before versus the risk of my getting COVID? Um, so there's, there's that uh, aspect of it going on too. But not all um, of the reasons that people question or refuse or hesitate around vaccines are about that. I mean, some of them are much more emotional, uh, much more belief-based. That's not about the tangible risk. It's about other things. Yeah. Yeah, and um, we have a, a question from Facebook that um, that we received on Facebook um, from Erica that you know um, lines up pretty nicely with this idea of the different factors that lead to um, hesitancy or concerns. And um, she's curious, why do you think that so many healthcare workers, in particular, are hesitant about taking the vaccine um, if they, as health workers, theoretically should know about the benefits and the importance and the impact? It's a really good question. <laughs> um, sometimes uh, it, I think that just comes to the fact that healthcare workers are are human too. <laughs> that uh, they go, they live in their communities. They have their own. Um, you know, they go home to what they hear in the neighborhood, and they're also on the front lines of the questioning. So they're exposed to a lot of questions, um, and they may start off uh, feeling like this is a good thing. But after the 10th person has said, are you sure I should have this? What about X, Y, and Z? And, and, and then they start to be confronted with a lot of uh, questions and, and rumors that they're not always confident that they can answer. And, and healthcare professionals, vaccinators, um, and, and nurses, they're not trained in vaccinology. Um, so some of the questions that parents are bringing in uh, are, are, you know, something for an immunologist or a vaccinologist, but not you know, they, they know how to administer the, the vaccine, what the, how to manage any adverse event, you know, how to give the right description. And it's, it's a difficult situation and could be enough to make one of some of them hesitate. Yeah, um, I mean, that's completely understandable. And it is important to think about how interdisciplinary all of these responses how, how are, how it does require different expertise within public health and outside of public health and communications as well. Um, and then, you know, in your book, you also specifically talk about the impact of contagion, um, the contagion of emotions, as well as the contagion of physical symptoms in perpetuating these vaccine rumors. Um, and I'm curious, how has that specifically played out, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic? 
Well, in the book, I'm talking particularly around what has uh, some have called psychosomatic reactions, and WHO has characterized it uh, last year actually as immunization stress-related reactions. And and I was particularly talking about after HPV vaccine, but we have seen it in other mass vaccine campaigns. Um, where you get some someone fainting or feeling nauseous or shaking or um, and it scares other people and and then you have kind of a domino effect of people reacting and having symptoms that they're very real symptoms but they are not because there's something wrong with the vaccine fluid itself per se but um, is more about a, an emotional reaction and it's this doesn't just happen with vaccines. But because it happens with vaccines and the way it, it spreads is, is pretty dramatic. And we've seen, for instance, in, with HPV, you know, we've had a situation in Japan, girls do YouTube videos. It happens then in Denmark, in Ireland, um, and I jumped over to Colombia, 600 girls across multiple schools having the similar symptoms. And we were, uh, collaborate closely with King's Institute of Psychiatry. And we're seeing that you don't just need that face-to-face -face in the same room um, contact. You can, through a video, can provoke that same anxiety. So, um, but they, there are manuals now, uh, a new manual launched this year to help uh, healthcare providers prepare and anticipate for it. And it, it's really about not the vaccine, the vaccination experience. And I think if there's one thing we've learned through that is how important it is to make a comfortable environment, to make people feel at ease. Um, I mean, I've even <laughs> been reading, even in, in the health um, service briefs, get a good night's sleep and have a good breakfast before you get your COVID vaccine. I mean, it. You say, what does that have to do with it? Well, it it does matter because it it's about not being anxious because that anxiety can become a physical manifestation. Yeah, yeah, and um, completely understanding the important role of comfort in any health experience. Yeah. Um, chamomile, chamomile, chamomile. Yeah. There's 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 honesty in that rumor. Um, we have another question um, from Nadira, um, and they want to know what are some of the most effective strategies that you can use when talking to friends and family who might be hesitant about the COVID-19 vaccine? Listen, I mean, I think one of the things we need to do is take a deep breath. They may be saying something you totally disagree with, but I think it's really important to listen to people's concerns. Um, the reasons for them may be totally not fact-based, um, but I, I really think we need to kind of change the conversation. It's become so polarized um, that it's not helpful. Um, and I, I, I would listen because I think that's already a start. Uh, you don't have to agree with people just because you listen to them. And I think to the extent that they're open, you can suggest some other experiences or other people to talk to. Um, but that's at least where I start. And usually if it's an extremely different view, um, I always try to find something we can agree on um, because that already reduces the tension in a, in a, in a conversation. Yeah, that's an excellent point and is so applicable to any topic outside of vaccine concerns. And it's interesting how much more lenient we are with our families um, for other topics um, outside of this one, especially, you know, speaking as a public health researcher. Um, so it's a good, it's definitely a good reminder. And um, we know that there are, you know, um, so many rumors, especially with regards to the COVID-19 vaccines um, that are causing some concerns. So I'd invite you all to take a listen to some of those. Thank you for taking my question. My elderly mother was offered the vaccine through her housing and she declined it because she heard lots of rumors that older people were at risk for unexplained death as a response. I'm terrified that she won't take it yet. What can I do to dispel these rumors and convince her? Yeah, 
That's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, uh, especially with regards to elderly populations that have been so disproportionately affected in group care settings. I think this is when talking about other people getting their vaccine helps. What we're increasingly seeing is social proof um, and the power of um, power of peers. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, there's an added element where, you know, the language that we use around vaccines and in responding to our family and friends and in researching these topics really matters. Um, so I'm curious about the challenges that you identify when either in research or in conversations, um, you hear um, folks referring to communities or individuals with questions as anti-vax. Um, if you can explain a bit more about that. I, I'm not a big fan of the term anti-vax because I, I think it's really um, kind of puts a category on something that has, to me, has so much diversity and, and the reasons are so different. Um, and frankly, if you talk to any of the people that are often referred to as anti-vax, they will absolutely disagree um, because they don't feel like they're anti-vax. They either want a safer vaccine or they want one without X ingredient or they just want to have a choice or they have something. Um, the, the language seems very antithetical, but um, mm -hmm. I, I have chosen the framing of confidence um, and you can have zero confidence and you can have 100% confidence. Um, but I think the more we can um, kind of through the use of language have less negative language, um, even a hesitancy to me, I mean, it's a bit less extreme than, than anti, but you know, it doesn't give you any fudge room. You know, if you're mm -hmm. hesitant, you can be a little or a lot, but you're still hesitant. Um, mm -hmm. I think we should think about people being undecided. I also yeah. think it's not unreasonable for people to be hesitant, particularly for instance, now. I think it's, and first time mothers having a, um, you know, going for the first vaccination, it's actually responsible for them to be asking some questions. So I think we're sending the wrong signal by saying, you know, I even saw some guidance the other day about preventing hesitancy and I want, I would encourage it. I mean, there's a limit to it, of course, but I think we need to figure out ways to be able to have sometimes difficult conversations, but um, the more we shut it down, the more polarized it'll become. Yeah, um, absolutely. And definitely this language is important across um, disciplines. So. Um, you know, we're, um, it's, it, it is a really important point to bring up for research, for advocacy, for communications. Um, and I really appreciate and respect your perspective on that. Um, let me now bring in Marcia Castro, Chair of the Department of Global Health and Population here at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, Joan Donovan, the Research Director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics and Public Policy at the Kennedy School, where her team researches media manipulation disinformation and adversarial media movements, um, and Kay Vishvishwanath, um, Professor of Health Communication here at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, who specializes in studying inequities in public health. Welcome to everyone. Thank you all for joining in. Okay. Uh, so let's start with Marcia. You are co-director of the Brazil Studies Program at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies. And in Brazil, um, we've seen quite the experience with COVID-19. Um, cases exploding even as vaccine processes roll out. Can you talk to us a bit about rumors, fears, and the spread of misinformation in Brazil? Sure. Thanks, Nat. Um, so the spread of disinformation in Brazil is particularly critical because in addition to rumors and conspiracy theories on social networks and communication apps, the president several members of his cabinet and even some physicians also contribute to spread misinformation about COVID-19 origin and treatment. That really creates a scenario in which individuals decide to comply or not to comply to public health recommendations based on their political views, not really based on science. Mm -hmm. Brazil is also a case study on uh, the use of WhatsApp to spread disinformation. And as it is often said, there are two different countries, the Brazil from WhatsApp and the real Brazil. 
and and WhatsApp is now the most popular communication app in Brazil. It's installed in you know the vast majority of active cell phones in the country. And a recent survey from the Brazilian Business School showed that about 97% of those polled in the survey reported WhatsApp as essential for their daily activities, including news consumption. So what makes WhatsApp so good to express this information is that it cannot be traced or exposed by fact-checking efforts. There are videos, audios, photos circulating with disinformation on the importance of the virus, the use of masks, the safety of vaccines, the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, and attacks to the integrity of science and scientists. So for the most part, this disinformation about the pandemic is politically framed helping to create this imaginary Brazil where the president is making the best decisions. The president initially indicated that he would not be vaccinated uh, and suggested that people who take the vaccine could turn into crocodiles. And as much as this may sound as a joke, it is enough to make some people in doubt about the safety of the vaccine. So here we have a scenario where this information meets a polarized society and creates major barriers for compliance to public health interventions. It's definitely a fascinating case study and um, the perfect time to bring in Joan, um, a leader in the disinformation research space. So we know that uh, last year there was a report from the Center for Countering Digital Hate that found that 147 of the top um, disinformation, especially and misinformation, specifically and explicitly anti-vax um, social media accounts have gained at least 7.8 million new followers since 2019. So in addition to that research, um, and based on your own research, how has this discourse changed in online spaces, including WhatsApp, but also such as Facebook? And does that differ from the conversations and spaces with other sort of fringe communities that you've studied? Um, so I wanna say thank you for the uh, very engaging conversation that I was allowed to kind of sit in on, uh, and I appreciate uh, Nat and Heidi is setting such a um, such a, a scene for us to be able to discuss this today. I uh, over at Chornstein Center, we we run a, a little research platform called the Media Manipulation Casebook. And what we're trying to do is map and track all the different tactics and opportunities and strategies used by media manipulators and disinformers to uh, basically, you know, either. Frankly, I mean, this is an industry, right? People are making a lot of money off of this. Uh, the political outcomes are aligned with the financial incentives. And as a result, everything open will be exploited. And this is why I really loved Heidi's book, uh, because what I was able to understand from just a short key phrase in her book where she wrote, you know, vaccines cause autism is a meme. And I was just like, I get it now. Because you have now 20 years of networked, uh, you know, skeptics, let's say, maybe they're not even anti-vax or anti-science, but they're networked and they're skeptical. And it doesn't really matter if you're in a group that was, you know, about this one thing one day, uh, the news provides this kind of opportunity for people to be introduced to more and different kinds of misinformation. Our team has started to notice though, as we investigate medical misinformation, uh, different from how we would look into like quackery, uh, you know, like our field of public health have been around, right? Like th this isn't their first, you know, show. But what's different and what Heidi really helped me grasp is that it's the networked environment, the capacity for scale, 20 years of building a movement online where the rest of us over here in, in, you know, maybe the science isn't perfect world. Maybe we do have questions. Uh, we're all kind of thrown into the same space in the moment of a pandemic. So when you search for what caused COVID-19, for the first couple of weeks, it was basically just white supremacists telling you how terrible China was. Then yeah. we figured out, and I'll put a, a little link in the chat, 
that Steve Bannon got very invested in, uh, and I mean invested in, in the sense of hundreds of, uh, at least a hundred million dollars has been invested in his rule of law foundation uh, to push anti-Chinese propaganda. So he went out and found a woman who was a postdoc in Hong Kong uh, to say, essentially, flew her to the United States, uh, paraded her around the media, and then released a report on Zenodo, which is an open science platform that claimed that COVID was a Chinese bioweapon. And within a day, like hundreds of thousands of people had been exposed to this rumor. It's not the case that it's traveling around and aunt tells an uncle, tells a brother, tells a sister, tells a friend, tells the grocery store clerk. It's not like that anymore. And so the speed, the scale, the the memetics of it, right? This like things that resonate, like Nat, we yeah. were talking about earlier, words I can't forget, gestures I can't forget, you know, watermelon seeds are, are going to grow a watermelon tree in your tummy, right? Mm -hmm. These things tend to add up. They tend to matter. And yeah. so our research has been definitely focused on uh, very specific case studies in which the openness and the scale of our media ecosystem are being leveraged yeah. uh, for political and financial influence. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, each each country, each community has their own um, digital and then also analog media ecosystems that are, you know, proliferating and propagating these in, in different ways. And we know in the U.S., um, for example, far right news consumption has soared over um, the last years. Um, and, you know, it's another way that also vaccine misinformation has proliferated so quickly. So um, this is a question for Vish. How can public health communicators help pierce that bubble or what should we be doing differently, um, acknowledging all of those factors that John mentioned? Thank you, Nat. Uh, th that's a great question. So I think one of the first things we need to do uh, is perceptions of some non-correction here, right? So one thing we should not forget is that there is, depending on the survey you are quoting or citing at any given time, 70% of the people are still want to get vaccinated or want to get or are waiting in line to get vaccinated. So when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, we might be communicating unintentionally that everybody is against vaccination, right? So it's very critical for us to really remind people that, that there is a large group of people, in fact, there is a majority out there that actually wants vaccines and that is willing to get vaccinated. So that, you know, the, the, the notion of this perceptions of social norms, what is normative, what is acceptable, the acceptable part of it is that people want to get vaccinated. In fact, you know, those of us who spend a lot of time studying these issues, especially online, uh, environment should not forget what is happening offline and how to connect those two. Offline, if you're looking for, if you're asking people, what are you looking for? They're not going out and searching for misinformation or disinformation. They're actually looking for very instrumental information. Where can I get vaccinated? How can I get an appointment? You know, do I have to get pay for it? So I, the, one of the first things we want to do is also communicate very clearly that their neighbors, their friends, their families are indeed getting vaccinated. And it's very important that they are a part of this larger movement, which is not resisting vaccines, but actually just pro-vaccines. So that's one of the most uh, critical things we need to you know, communicate and, 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 and put it out there. Second, I think, you know, there is a lot of heterogeneity among people, you know, even who are hesitant, right? You know, this is what Heidi was talking about. It's not one term, right? So we always talk about fears and facts, right? The, you know, that's kind of a deficit model that just because if we can pre prevent, present facts to people, they somehow will make a decision, you know, that, that, that uh, they'll go ahead and get vaccinated. I think it's not that. I think, you know, there are, a, 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 panoply of reasons, a variety of reasons why people may be, you know, somewhat reluctant to get vaccinated. And I think we need to understand, is it fear in, in a polarized environment, our own survey data showed in a polarized environment, it may be anger, right, for some of those people. Anger and fear are not the same things, you know, so we need to really yeah. figure out what are some of the reasons, I think this part of listening 
you know, uh, is, is very critical, I think, that was mentioned earlier. Yeah. What yeah. exactly are the reasons why people are, are not coming forward? This, that's a smaller percentage uh, of yeah. people. And see if there is a way we can address those issues rather than speaking to them. Maybe we should be speaking with them and listening to them uh, and understand that uh, because I think there is that heterogeneity in audience that we need to address from a public health communication perspective. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think it is, um, you know, more of a recent phenomena that especially, um, you know, intergovernmental organizations, other health institutions are really acknowledging the legitimate mistrust in health institutions that's experienced by marginalized communities, communities of color, which is such an enduring um, issue. And we have a, a recording that outlines that a little bit as well. I'm Reverend Liz Walker, pastor of Roxbury Presbyterian Church in the heart of Boston. And my neighborhood has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. But I was surprised by the community and the church members who said they did not want to take the vaccine despite the disproportionate impact on our community. We then called on Dr. Anthony Fauci because we wanted these people to feel valued. Dr. Anthony Fauci said, yes, we had a Zoom town hall, thousands of people showed up and the needle moved. Some people did change their minds, but there's so many more who are still resistant to the vaccine. They don't trust the medical care system. They don't trust any systems. What can we do now to try to engage those people, to try to get them to change their minds? Yeah, I think um, exactly as you were saying, Vish, um, Reverend Walker makes a really good point here. And um, she was appointed to the COVID-19 Vaccine Advisory Board in Massachusetts um, in the United States to advise on vaccine communication and equity, which is really important. But I do wanna highlight again that so much of this mistrust in institutionalized health and in um, health delivery is is legitimate it's you know there's intersections with limited language availability and accessibility with power dynamics um you know with um racialized media coverage of perceptions of vaccine hesitancy so um i'd love to open this to um everyone and and hear if you have any particular thoughts on this just if I'm, uh, go ahead Heidi. That's okay. uh, i'm <laughs> probably have similar things to say no, I just think the power of, of really from within communities, it's so important. Um, we've seen this in so many immunization programs. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's about trusted networks and particularly when you're anxious and you're uncertain. Um, you need you need your pastor to tell you, or you need you know your old schoolmate, or um, you need someone that you feel like um, in this confusing mix of information and histories. I mean, this is and personal and community histories that are heavy. I mean, you were talking about myths that and rumors from childhood. Well, some of these aren't myths. I mean, there are some pretty um uh disturbing histories that we have to have a bit of empathy for yeah yeah i, I think you know heidi hit the nail on the head i think it is it is not uh, a myth uh in fact you know uh, even our own data show that an african-american groups are hesitant but the reason is is absolutely legitimate reason i think we don't have to invoke historical reasons it's day-to-day -day discrimination, it's day-to-day -day racism, structural racism and institutional racism, you know, that they encounter every day, you know, which is responsible for this, you know. So I, I think, you know, there are absolutely, uh, you know, legitimate reasons for this kind of a hesitancy or reluctance. But, but it is also a fact, it's also a fact that a large number of racial and ethnic minority groups are trying to sign up are trying to sign up to get vaccinated. It is a system's failure that we have not provided the access that is absolutely necessary. If you look at Boston, where we are establishing these mass vaccination clinics, it's an embarrassment of the way we have done it. You know, Only now we are beginning to provide and improve that access. Uh, so I think it is, it is absolutely important and critical to really look at localized networks, community-based organizations such as churches, and improve the access. It's not a question of hesitancy there. 
Yeah, absolutely. I'm curious. Um, Joan Marcia? Yeah, I can actually bring up a historical fact on this. Um, one of the most um, known examples of, um, you know, a campaign to vaccinate people against smallpox in Brazil, it's called the revolt of the vaccine in 1904. And it wasn't a revolt against the vaccine. It was a revolt against the government. So here's an example that the lack of trust cancel out all the benefits of a vaccine of a disease that was a major scourge in the country in, in the country and in the city at that time and the population revolted it was uh, people died and buses were destroyed and people went to jail and afterwards there was a lot of conversations there were a lot of public figures getting vaccinated sending the message that they can they can still be against the government but they can trust the vaccine because that's going to save their lives but it's a famous chapter in the history and sure enough we still live exactly you know not not the same but we leave the same underlying problems to this day yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and, you know one one thing i would like to contribute to this to this conversation is uh, we have a report up on our uh, media manipulation.org. I'm not a plugger, I'm sorry, but Brandy Collins Dexter did the work very early on in the pandemic to, to understand how certain myths were going to proliferate among black communities online. And part of the problem was, is you had all of these tech companies kind of looking over here saying, well, we're going to focus our energy on anytime someone searches for COVID or coronavirus. And so you would see those notifications come up or what they call interstitials would be like foggy glass over things <laughs> uh, as you're looking at posts online. Uh, but they didn't actually take into account that people were gonna give it a nickname like the Rona, right? And so within certain communities, people are gonna talk about vaccine hesitancy, uh, vac have vaccine hesitant type conversations but they're not going to get caught up in these kind of conventional ways in which um, yeah. we do content moderation and curation. And in yeah. that report, she she shows very clearly how certain kinds of myths uh, were perpetuated by influencers and celebrities as well as uh, sports uh, figures and it directly into people's feeds, right? It's not the case that you have to go look for this information. It shows up in a very banal kind of way. It's, you know, cousin's birthday party, friend's pizza dinner, lonely cat by a window, you know, black people can't get coronavirus. Next up is, uh, you know, grandma getting her shot, right? And so you're just like, you're kind of inundated with it. And depending upon uh, how it hooks into you, like how it's presented, if it's someone you uh, have what we call online, it's a bit of a psychological kind of term, but parasocial relationships with, right? Like people that you follow online that you trust, but you don't know them. And they're not actually someone you'd turn on the TV and see, or they're not, you know, they're, they're these kind of like, you know, mid tier um, online influencers. And you kind of kind of know who you're looking at to even know what's at stake. Mm -hmm. And I, I present that as a way to understand that different communities are going to are going to repair in, in, in uh, any vaccine hesitancy type conversations in different ways, right? And so we actually have to focus very deeply on the communities themselves and move away from this idea that well, if we just put a yellow banner up over everything, somehow we will fix it. And that's one of the things that our research has really aimed to do over the years is just to say to people, we see it too. <laughs> uh, it is an influence hop in, in some cases. Sometimes there is dark money and dark power behind it. Other times, and especially with medical misinformation, if there's anything you could learn from me, I know I've learned a lot from anybody else, everybody else on this panel, but that medical misinformation is actually very different than political disinformation. People share it out of just in case they share love, it because they yeah. think it might help someone yeah it's out of love yeah. in a lot of ways and so you can't actually apply a strategy which i've advocated for in the past around strategic silence which simply means to me a white supremacist does something to get attention in the media 
don't call them up and put them on CNN and say, why'd you do it, right? Actually try to understand the impact that they aim to have and bring on people that have been harmed by that kind of violence. Yeah, absolutely. But people then think, oh, well, that works over here. I'm going to do that over here with medical misinformation. And what Heidi's work really helps us understand is, no, don't do that. Actually stage ways in which communities can engage, answer the questions, the ways in which we can raise up uh, the profiles and, and the community builders in yeah. different places uh, who can do that work of making people feel as if, yeah, maybe I don't trust the state and maybe I don't even trust big pharma, but also like this is life and death, right? This is life is full of risks and Definitely. you gotta have good information to, to calculate those risk factors and make those decisions. And right now, medical misinformation is just far outpacing uh, yeah. timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. Sorry to get on my high horse with that no, one. No, uh, but shutting, shutting down the information is a non-starter. I, I just think it's, I mean, I, I lived and worked in Nepal for a few years, and I remember the king sometimes would switch, flick the switch on the cell system, or I remember once there was a concern about some, you know, uh, disturbance in the public, and, and they said, uh, the only thing that can be on the radio is uh, is entertainment, no news. And what did they do? They started singing the news. Uh, and it was brilliant. I mean, it was brilliant strategy on their part. Um, but, you know, this doesn't need the internet for these things have, to have happened historical, historically. Um, fake news goes way back, but I think the creativity of the other side far, uh, far outruns uh, our creativity in public health. We've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, definitely. And um, this relates to research that my team at the Digital Health Lab is doing right now um, that we discussed a bit as, uh, as a team before this call started um, around the idea that a lot of misinformation and disinformation and responses in the past have been um, compared with a truth, the idea that there is a definitive truth, there's a specific piece of information that you can validate this misinformation against. And in science, that's really, you know, that's really not possible. And the missing information or the mid-information as we're developing a framework around is so specifically important to respond to. So um, at this point, it, might, it really fits nicely to go to a question from a doctor who's, um, patients are asking him whether or not they should get the vaccine. I'm a physician with over 30 years of experience caring for children and adults with chronic illnesses, many of whom believe they were vaccine injured. Most have immune systems that are already overstimulated. So this is my question. Given that the COVID vaccine appears to overstimulate the immune system of healthy recipients, how can I ethically and morally recommend this vaccine to my patients, knowing that it has not been studied long-term for risks, particularly with autoimmunity? I know all about vaccine misinformation. What I am most concerned about is the missing information. I like it. <laughs> I mean, it's a good point. <laughs> it is, you know, and, and one of the things that we've noticed, especially around uh, this uh, Dana Boyd and, and Michael Gobiowski Gobi at Data and Society talks about these as data voids, which is exactly what uh, certain kinds of media manipulation take advantage of is you're looking for answers. And one of my mantras is you are most vulnerable to misinformation when you know what you don't know because that's yeah. what you're searching for. That's the invitation, that's the openness that you have. And yeah. our technical systems online have been designed in such a way to, to really capture that and, and optimize for it. And so we have to be very cognizant of the road ahead around yeah. what are gonna be the public interest obligations for tech platforms that will show us uh, timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. Yeah. Every couple of posts, give me in the timeline, yeah. you know, what the weather is, a little bit of local news. The <laughs> law on the radio, you know, in the U.S. is very simple. Is you, you play your, you know, your rock songs, and at the end of Pearl Jam, uh, the DJ comes on and says, hey, you know, uh, it's 78 degrees today, and, uh, you know, there's a city yes, council hey. meeting tonight. They don't yeah. want to do that. 
we had to yeah. make a law for that. And we and we got to make some regulations that encourage those kind of public interest obligations in our timelines and social yeah. media feeds. Yeah, and the public health community doing science publicly and letting us know about the process. Um, before we go, I know we're heading to the end of our conversation. I just wanted to ask everyone quickly, in your opinions, should vaccines be mandated? Maybe let's start with Heidi. Well, I don't think we can mandate. You mean vaccines in general or COVID or? Let's broaden it to vaccines in general. I think it's all about setting. Um, I don't think any government's going to, well, I, I, it depends on setting. Um, it, vaccines are required when you go to school and put other people at risk. They're required if you're sometimes in certain healthcare settings. If you're a daycare worker, there are certain vaccines you take. And it's not about you. It's not the government saying you need to take it for you. Uh, it's about you need to take it because if you don't, you're putting other people at risk. And I mean, for Hajj, for Hajj pilgrimage, you have to take at least three vaccines before you come into this mass migration uh, of people. And I'm sure COVID's going to be added to that list. To go to certain countries in Africa, you need a yellow fever vaccine. Um, and I think right now, the attention to about the COVID passport, I think we should normalize it. Everybody should have who gets a COVID vaccine should absolutely have it in their yellow card or whatever. <laughs> I mean, I've got mine since childhood, which has every vaccine I've had in there. And when it's needed, you show it. But um, so it's really about we need to think about when it becomes a mandate, it's about the the society, it's about the public. And if you don't want to participate in that event, or if you didn't want to go to school, I mean, some people um, get particularly upset about the school vaccination. Of course, there's always medical exemption. If for some reason you can't take a vaccine. But the thing that saved, that calmed the boisterous, very loud, aggressive, anti-compulsory vaccine movement in the 1800s, the thing that shut it down was an opt-out clause, the um, conscientious objector clause that I used to think was about not going to war, but actually mm -hmm. it started with the opt-out clause for a smallpox vaccination. Yeah, so the setting and the context. Yeah. Interesting. Does anyone else have any thoughts on mandated vaccines to add before we close out? Yeah, I, I fully agree with, with Heidi. And I would say that if we lived in an utopian world where science was respected and solidarity was the norm, we wouldn't be here discussing this, but we do live in a dystopian world. And, and so here we are. Um, I, I don't think we can enforce. I think context matters. I don't think we can enforce without having massive backlash, including protests and lawsuits. But I do think we should connect this with certain groups um, just like we have now for many. Um, and, I, and I think that would work. I mean, we have countries that have cash transfer programs that are conditional on children being in school and being vaccinated. So why shouldn't hospitals and schools require proof of vaccination from every employee? I think it's fair. In, we have the, as, as Heidi mentioned, the, the, the vaccine for uh, yellow fever if you're traveling. So I think there are situations that we can keep and expand a little bit, but I don't think it's possible to have a mandatory, complete uh, vaccination. Um, it, I, I just can't see that happening. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think what we should do is make it difficult to use an excuse to get out of vaccination. Mm. Uh, but persuasion is a key. I think there is a, I mean, people can make all kinds of excuses not to get vaccinated, but I think we can counter that. But at the end of the day, it's persuasion uh, without uh, getting a fight on our hands, I think, you know, and res building the segment. So. Yeah. Um, I think what we've highlighted through this conversation is a the importance of context, whether we're having conversations on social media, the limitations that are offered by the platforms, some of the challenges that they pose on effective communications. Um, we've learned a lot about the difference between myths and rumors, the language that we can and should be using to describe these types of challenges. And I think most importantly, how 
interdisciplinary this field really is. We have a demographer, an anthropologist, a disinformation researcher, a communications researcher, all on this in this conversation sharing insights that um, you know hopefully can build off of one another, and we can we can really try to strengthen and improve our responses to health information inequity. Um, I wanted to uh, thank Dean Williams of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health um, and all of the guests today. I want to thank Heidi Larson, Marcia Castro, Joan Donovan, and Vish Vishwanath. Um, thank you for having me today um, as your host. It's been a total honor. And um, of course, definitely check out Stuck, How Vaccine Rumors Start and Why They Don't Go Away to learn more about um, these issues. And hopefully we can build upon this field together. Thank you so much. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans, and soon they will be available to everyone. This vaccine means hope. It will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. I want to go back to work and I want to be able to move around. To visit with Michelle's mom, to hug her and see her on her birthday. You know what I'm really looking forward to is going to opening day in Texas Rangers Stadium with a full stadium. We've lost enough people and we've suffered enough damage. In order to get rid of this pandemic, it's important for our fellow citizens to get vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated because we want this pandemic to end as soon as possible. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. So roll up your sleeve and do your part. This is our shot. Now it's up to you.